I believe we are now live on Facebook and on YouTube. Success. Welcome, everybody, um, and good afternoon. Hopefully, it's a sunny afternoon where you are, and thank you for taking um, the time to join us here on our Incubator Ignite first ever live stream. Um, and what a superb subject um, it, this is for um, us to be covering um, today. And this week, this week is obviously mental health awareness week um, and the subject that we're all focusing on is kindness and uh, we we'd love to have a discussion today with our friend Craig Fern from Business Mental Wellbeing to to really share with you our learnings and Craig specifically his learnings about business mental well-being and well-being in the in the workplace so um, thank you Craig for taking the time to join us today we're delighted to be working with you Incubator to support um, our, our people and our friends in Incubator at, at this time, but all the time to improve and, and, and have sustainable mental well-being. Um, so delighted to have you with us, Craig. You're the CEO of Business Mental Wellbeing. You, um, we, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to kick off with you uh, giving me a little bit of an intro. But before we do, for those of you who have joined us successfully on Facebook and on YouTube, We'd love for you to engage, so please do join us. Please um, put your comments down below or on this side or this side, wherever they appear on Facebook. We'd love to see your comments. We can see them in front of us, and we will try and pick those up, and we'll try and answer any questions um, that you do submit um, at the end. And those those who are unable to answer, we'll, we will follow up on, and Craig has, has offered his ongoing support there. So thanks very much, Craig. No so without further without further ado, Craig, we're going to keep it nice and short, nice and sweet, you know, maybe 30 minutes, maybe we'll run over, and that's okay. It'll be a sign of a good conversation. Um, so, Craig, we've, we've been talking for, for, let's say, more or less a year. We, we've been in different locations, yet we're both now in Cornwall. So... Um, obviously, COVID has changed our, our whereabouts and somewhat for the better because we both we both love, love the home nation uh, or home county, should we say. Um, but, you know, I know you for having 15 years experience and 15 years as, as a mental well-being consultant and, and a very good mental well-being consultant by all accounts. You've recently been nominated for best mental well-being, mental health consultant in the UK. So we're in good hands. And I'm really looking forward to learning more from you about you know how people can be coping at this time and an ongoing as well. So again, great great to be working with you. Um, and without further ado, Craig, would you um, kindly share a little bit of your experience? Tell us who you are, your experience about business mental wellbeing, and you know what your your purpose and mission is for the business. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been doing this for about 15 years now. Um, I personally have suffered from mental ill health since about the age of 12. So I went through secondary school and, uh, you know, since that point forward. I, um, my, my sort of first early working career, unfortunately, I had to, uh, to leave due to a, a medical condition. And I then spent about 18 months um, in, in isolation, so self-isolating at home. Um, I distanced myself from family and friends. Um, at the time, my best mate was a pizza delivery guy who used to drop one off every every day that kept me yeah, going. Uh, although I never met him, I used to sell tape the money to the door. So, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure he was lovely. Um, so, uh, yeah. you have attempted to go back and find out who that pizza delivery guy was. That I, I never you. did. I wish I had. Um, you know, he, he always used to make a good tip out of me as well every week. So uh, <laughs> you know, maybe that was the that was the key to it. But um, you know, I, I I really had my struggles in that sort of eighteen month period. Um, I went through sort of the NHS treatment for uh, mental health. So I went down the the counselling routes, um, and I was going in and going through my my sort of daily counseling coming home and finding that actually i wasn't really getting much from it um just on a personal note so it got worse because i was then sort of um it was my fault it wasn't working for me um it was working for everybody else because the nhs fixes everyone but it wasn't working for me so during that 18 months i attempted suicide twice um yeah. and things got pretty bleak um but 
it came to a point where I actually sort of, it, it was either had to start doing something again or, you know, actually this, this really was the end of the line. And uh, my partner, uh, who's now my, my wife, she, um, she basically said to me that, you know, you've, you've got to, you've got to come back into this. You're not worthless. You're not pointless. So I then started going back to um, my NHS counselling sessions with a completely different idea on them. So what I was doing was I was taking what they were giving me. I was going away. I was keeping the bits that I liked and worked for me. And then I was replacing the other bits with bits that I was going out and working out for myself. So, you know, this was the approach that I then took to mental health from that point forward. So it was it was very much a collaborative experience when I'm, I'm working with people and companies. And it's it's not about that one size fits all scenario. It's about actually working out what works best for that individual and allowing them to then sort of walk away with that that toolkit, if you want, to live their life and take back control of their life rather than becoming reliant on somebody like me. So business mental well-being was was set up uh, off the back of another company called Lighthouse Mentoring, where I, I deal mainly with um, students and private clients. Um, and I, I kind of felt at the time that that business maybe wasn't not taking this as seriously as they should, but actually working out the right ways of dealing with this you know lots of lots of rhetoric was going around lots of people were saying this is the right way to do it this isn't the right way to do it but again like a person every business is different and every business requires a different way of, of working and how many so, years ago was that craig when you first set how was how many years ago was it when you first set out and you had that observation so um when i first so this was about um seven eight years ago when I first started sort of really trying to influence the business market um, and actually sort of saying, you know what, this can work for you guys as well. And, you know, we need to work out every business is different. Every sector is different, but all your employees are different as well. Um, there are lots of really nice blanket approaches you can put out there, but actually sometimes you need to have somebody around who can, deal with the individuals as individuals and deal with the businesses as individual businesses. Um, so, you know, that was about seven, eight years ago. Um, I had lots and lots of conversations with lots and lots of different people. Um, yep. Some were fun, some weren't fun. Uh, some were just as much as sort of, you know, thanks very much, but no thanks. We, you know, we're not interested. We've gone through that sort of um, rhetoric within uh, business now where we understand or are getting a better understanding of just how important well-being and especially mental well-being is in the business community. Um, you know, we've even had big, big uh, companies like Deloitte putting figures on just how big these things are. So yeah. from a purely money-based situation, the latest figures that I read, uh, Deloitte said that um, – Absenteeism for mental health costs the UK economy 40 billion, 14 billion a year. Sorry, 6 billion. Uh, then we've got um, staff turnover, which is 6 billion a year based on mental yeah. health. So not feeling valued by your company or, or things on those sorts of lines. And then the cost of retraining and bringing in a new member of staff. And then we've yeah. got presenteeism, which is the, the kind of new kid on the block who's always been there, but nobody's really actually acknowledged yeah that, that works out at sort of 22 billion pounds a year so if you add them all together you're talking yeah, yeah a, a huge <laughs> amount of money out of the yeah. uk economy yeah and of course you know that that is the sort of argument that that business does listen to uh, <laughs> when you can start throwing around figures that, that are that sort of huge um, business mental well-being was set up to actually specifically target presenteeism. So presenteeism, right? Presenteeism, yeah. So um, presenteeism for for anyone who's not come across it 
is, is effectively turning up to work with a mental health issue, that means that you're not as productive while you're in the workplace. And that can then knock on to your colleagues um, and the business itself. So if you're coming in and there's, you know, you, you're really struggling with your mental health and you're just staring at your screen and you're not really doing much of what you're doing, your colleagues then have to pick that up. And if your colleagues are picking that up, of course, you then get the next level, which is colleagues sort of, well, hang on a minute, what's going on? And because mental health is a, a hidden impairment, we we can't see it unless people are actually talking about it. So we don't actually understand what it is that's going on behind the scenes um, for that individual. You know, nobody comes to work to be not there. You know, we, we go for a reason yeah. and that's to be productive. So we set up, or I set up the business to actually target presenteeism. Now, I, I came up with an analogy for this, which uh, relates to a, a bucket, which seems apt for the shed, to be honest. <laughs> <But, laughs> uh, so effectively, um, if you can imagine a bucket, so that bucket is a person. And all day, mm -hmm. every day, You've got water that's dripping into that bucket from a tap, and that's stress, and that's anxiety, and that's that sort of mental health. And it keeps drip, drip, drip. And then suddenly something will come along that's really, really sort of stressful or gets to you, and it's like someone turning that tap right on, flooding that bucket, water level rises. Yeah. You actually go to the gym, and you're eating healthily, and you're sleeping properly, and you're doing the things that we know will help you're bailing water out of that bucket with a cup. So you're taking yeah. it out. But eventually what happens is that that water level will continue to rise until it gets to just below the lip of the bucket. Now, traditionally, business waits for the water to get just below the lip of the bucket, and then they go, oh, hang on, there's a problem here. We need, so, need to do something about this. So they come along and they drill a hole in the side of the bucket just below the lip of the bucket. So it's draining water out the side, but actually it only takes that little to actually go over the bottom. Yeah. So business mental well-being was set up to drill the hole in the bottom of the bucket. So actually that water is draining constantly all the time. So it doesn't reach that, that higher level. So that was the, the sort of concept behind putting us together in the first place. So if you target the problem before it becomes a massive problem or you target the yeah. issue before it gets out of control you've got a much better chance of dealing with it in a productive way than actually going through those sorts of issues so that was the the thinking behind business mental well-being and, and certainly the the personal journey for me um to actually sort of take that negative experience but i think from my point of view it allows me to I always say that that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And for me, yeah. I can look at this from an empathetic point of view. I've I've lived it um, rather than what people with mental health traditionally don't want, which is a sympathetic point of view. You know, we, we don't need that. Um, oh, poor you. What we need is, look, I understand that there's a, an issue. How can we we address this? Craig, could you just repeat that phrase again? Yeah, so sure. Got that. Maybe we can put that in a banner at the bottom as well, just as you repeat it. So, so for me, it's, it's very much people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. So when you're walking in for the first time to see somebody regarding your mental health or you're thinking to yourself, should I go and talk to somebody about my mental health? There are lots of different places you can go, lots of different people who have lots of different qualifications and letters and, and things after their name that look really impressive on paper. But for me, it was always about, does this person actually care about me or do they care about a number that they need to get off that, that list? So, you know, when dealing with individuals and dealing with companies, I care passionately about every company and individual I work with because ultimately I suppose I'm one of the few businesses that's actually out there to do myself out of business and the idea yeah. is that you know if if we do this right and we put put you in a position to rely on yourself you don't need me and then you can move on and do what you need to do 
rather than me sort of hanging around there and you constantly coming back, you know, sure, come back, let's have a chat, let's, you know, check in. If there's an issue, we'll deal with it. But I want to give the power back to you guys as a business or to the individuals to actually strive forward and, and continue to get better rather than me just sitting and, and waiting for things to happen. So, you know, I yeah. care about who I work with uh, and I'm pretty picky about it as well because I like people who have the same attitude as I do. Good. Well, we're delighted to be part of the group that you've that you've picked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and staying on this topic, you know, what what results have you seen be demonstrated when somebody does then know how much you care as a business or as a manager for them? Sure. What difference does it make? So when, when you look at a business as a culture, um, and, you know, people say culture in business an awful lot. Um, you know, there's a culture of this and a culture of that. We don't do this well and we don't do that well. People don't normally start with the positives that they do do well and then work backwards from that point. They start from the worst bits and then you're on the back foot immediately because your mind is in that really negative way of looking at it. So when I'm going into businesses and, and sort of, uh, I'm looking to influence the culture of that business. So I'm looking to influence how people view themselves as individuals within the business and how they view the business uh, as, a, as a whole. So, you know, a, a lot of the biggest success stories have been where there have been sort of huge staff turnover issues or there have been um, sort of uh, lack of awareness or, or things along those sorts of lines. But the ones that for me are the best ones are the ones where the company sort of goes we we know and we want to help we just don't know how um because we you know we we deal with with computing or we deal with you know we're, we're not experts in this field um you know and and the best sort of cases for me are when people actually identify that you know what um if i wanted somebody to fix my you know, my leg, I broke my leg, I would not go to my HR department or whatever the case might be and say, oh, I've got a broken leg. Can you, or my yeah. line manager or whatever the case might be, can you please set my leg and put it in a cast and whatever, <laughs> these types of things. So it's the the actual sort it of... Sounds great when you put it that way, doesn't it? When, it, when you put it in a, in a physical example. You know, we, we look very much at the... Um, the sort of mental and physical aspects of, of health within a business, because obviously businesses, are, you know, we're looking for them to be the best places they can be for people to come and work. Um, and physical health is, is clearly part of that. You know, we don't want people marching around and getting electric shocks off of bare wires. And if yeah. somebody does have a physical injury, then we have somebody at hand who can sort of go in and provide very basic support. Um, mental health in itself is, is in there as well. And we have uh, mental health first aiders. And, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with the guys that you've got um, over the last few weeks uh, who are doing an amazing job at, at actually sort of trying to understand the nature of what's in front of them and direct that, that culture change. Uh, and it can't be understated, the, the fact that, they're going out there, they're putting themselves out on a limb to make a difference um, by saying, come and talk to me. Um, and, and this is a huge thing to do. You know, pe people actually saying to you, if you've got an issue, come and talk to me and actually meaning it. Yes. Because a lot of the time we hear people saying, oh, yeah, if there's any problems, you know, just come back to me and it's fine. And you know full well that in the back of your head, what you've got is somebody saying, yeah, right, you know, whatever. Every yeah. time I've spoken to the guys that, that you've got, I am in no doubt that they genuinely mean what they say and they're genuinely yeah. in there making that, that difference. And that's why they're a great team for me to get involved with um, yeah. because they are so keen to change and improve by being positive moving forward rather than negative looking backwards. So it, it's very easy to point the finger and say, you know, or oh, we've never been like this, or we've never done it this way. But to actually 
take the reins and say, well, okay, we never have, but why shouldn't we? So let's do it. Yeah. It, it, it's something that, you know, I, I think takes a, a brave business culture to, to go down. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the focus this week is, of course, kindness and kindness matters. And no more is that demonstrated by those individuals on the mental health committee and the kindness that they're offering to those people who need it when they need it. So, yeah, grateful for those those people and grateful for you working with them. Oh, they they really are great. Very good. And and they're watching. So uh, thanks. Well, thanks I, to, to I, I not have told that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, 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 not at all. They they are phenomenal. Yeah, yeah they, they really are. I can see a couple of them smiling behind the scenes here on the on the um, <laughs> software we're using. So very good. So so Craig, that bucket has water pouring in at various rates, and you know certain events happening change change events happening no doubt increases or decreases the flow of water into that bucket we're, we're clearly going through a time of significant change and it's affecting people in very different and individual ways um what what a, a what impact are you seeing as a result of the last couple of months and in, in onset of as a result of covid how are you seeing people cope with it and what support can you offer or what advice can you give to people to help them support themselves, their friends, their family, their colleagues? Sure. So at the moment, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm looking at society and the companies that I'm working with. And there seems to be a general trend that for, you know, maybe the first three weeks, everyone was sort of, you know, okay, it's, it's three weeks. We, we can deal with this. And then we've, we've gone through the next sort of three or four weeks and everyone's sort of, okay, I'm not feeling as bad as I thought I would be uh, at this point. However, now that we've had the next trench being put in place, all of a sudden we're now starting to get people saying, hang on, no, <laughs> we, we've gone far enough. Um, and, you know, what we are getting... Um, I was talking to, to some of your guys uh, about the, the concept of isolation. And immediately, you know, people think isolation, we uh, we lock ourselves away and we don't talk to anyone. And, and, and that's the way, you know, isolation works. And actually, we're doing this now in the pandemic. We're isolating. From a mental health point of view, isolation is, is much more encompassing. So, you know, if, if we are isolating, we still have ways of reaching out. But if we are self-isolating from our own sort of mental health side of things, just in the same way that I did, you start cutting down your contact with people who matter to you. You start cutting down the amount of time that you spend doing things that you enjoy, because actually there's that, that concept that you don't deserve it. Right. Or you shouldn't be going to doing this or why, you know, what's the point? I may as well just, and, and again, your, your whole sort of life contracts and becomes very much about this very small confined space that you're in and you're not quite sure how to deal with this. Yeah. Um, I think the big things to, to bear in mind, and, and again, I go back to sort of some of the, the sort of more common interventions that are out there. So, the reaching out of people to you makes you feel good. And the reaching out of people to you not work related. So if my boss rings me up and goes, you know, you're right, mate, how are things? And you're like, whoa, immediately you 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 would go through that stage of well, hang on a minute, this isn't about work. Well, yeah. why, are you, why are you ringing me? This isn't work. But actually, the longer that conversation goes on and the more that individual is just trying to find out about you, how you are. And remember, you you know these people because you've been working with them. You've been at desks with them. Um, that actual sort of Zoom contact, that face-to-face, -face, <laughs> virtual face-to-face -face, is, is massively important because, you know, people then start to remember there's more outside of that that sort of initial bubble yeah I, certainly from a business point of view i i recommend it to everyone that i'm working with that these are sort of once a week check-ins just to find out how somebody is yeah 
it's also nice to be able to to feel part of that community and once you know that one person's interested then it's easier to approach the next person and speak to the next person and you know if you're doing sort of um quizzes during your day or um you know i wrote a, a music quiz for a company that i was working with the other day um and they played it on their internal uh, radio stationy type thing uh, yeah. listening out for various songs being part of what's going on Again, uh, I think structure cannot be overstated as, as being important. Um, I think an awful lot of what seems to be happening... Is that structure as a business or is that structure as an individual, you know, structure to your day, keeping a routine? So I, I think there's there seems to be this, um, to a certain amount of people, they're going, I'm working from home. I don't want somebody to think that I'm taking the mickey and, and this is no. presenteeism. So I'm going to work twice as hard for twice as long. Uh, right. and, you know, that's what I need to do because mm -hmm. that way Joe isn't going to come along and say, hang on a minute, you know, you've not been as productive as you would have been in work. So working from home clearly isn't the, the sort of, it's, it's actually realizing that you can structure your own day around all these other things. So if your company's got things going on, you don't have to be on everything. If, if it's outside of that working time, if it's inside of the working time and it's stipulated, then clearly, you know, that's that's part of your job. But yeah. if there's stuff going on outside, you don't have to be on everything just to say that you've been on it. If you want to go and sit in the garden, go and sit in the garden. Don't feel obliged that you constantly have to engage with absolutely everything. Engage yeah. with what you want to engage with. You know, good employers are not looking to sort of intrude on the entirety of your life what they're looking to do is provide you with ways of interacting that they feel would be beneficial for you at that particular moment in time just like if the guys went out for a beer after work you don't have to go <laughs> to the pub you could decide that yeah. the time. but because of all this we kind of feel more that we have to and and that actually you know oh, well, if everybody else is going and I'm not there, then they're going to think that I'm not. Whereas when we're going home, it's okay because we're going, well, I live 10 miles away and actually, you know, it's a bit of a tube ride or, or whatever the case might be. Yeah. So I think that certainly from a personal point of view at home, you know, get that structure to your day. Be making sure that you're waking up at a decent time. Do your work, not 10 times your work, not, you know, just you know what your work is. You know what the, the score is. You're the professional who's doing that particular thing and have faith in your, your company to actually realise that you're, this is an unprecedented time and we're not out there to, to sort of beat people with a stick. We're trying to work with you. Um, but from the company's point of view in, in terms of, of structure and what they're providing, it's actually sort of being available and, you know, I think uh, a couple of things that I've had people do is cut, actually have somebody senior position within the company send out a newsletter once a week, once a day, whatever the case might be, cutting down on the amount of noise and chatter and rubbish that's out there. Because we all know what it's like. You're on a computer and your Facebook pops up and whatever else and you hear that, you know, a London bus was found on the moon. Um you're like, well, hang on, what, what's all this sort of stuff? Or uh, COVID is is sort of coming down from Mars or, or whatever these things are. So actually having that yeah. ability to just say, I'm, I'm going to park all that. I've got one source of X. And this is what I need to know about to do my job and to be where I am. So, you know, I think yeah. that's the structure in one and the structure in the other. Craig, there's a certain irony in this next question, which it relates to we're spending so much time now on our screens in front of the cameras. And, you know, it's actually, it's nice to turn the camera off sometime and just have a good old phone, phone, phone conversation. But how important is it for people to get time away from screens, both laptop, TV, mobile and so on? And what what simple, easy advice can you give to people? Perhaps some tips um, that are that are different to the things that we're kind of commonly hearing. Sure. So time away from screen is is really important right now. 
um, time away from social media is probably far more important than time away from screen. Right. Um, you know, I uh, I always bang on about this, and, and well before all of this. So, for me, uh, when I uh, my my bedroom is where I go to sleep. So my mobile phone does not go to my bedroom at all, ever. In fact, right. I've got a little phone safe downstairs next to the the phone, and uh, myself uh, and my wife we take our phones and we put them in the safe, and then we leave them there. And when we get up again the following morning, we come downstairs and, and we can get our mobile phones out of the safe. But until then, the safe is locked. Now, all right, there's an override password in case something went absolutely crazy or whatever. <laughs> might be. But the point for me is it never has. Um, we've all got landlines, whether we like it or not, most of the time if we want broadband. So if somebody really yeah. needs it, they've got my home phone number, they can yeah. ring the old-fashioned way. Um for me, actually getting that phone and putting it away is is massively important. It goes on do not disturb. It, it doesn't it doesn't flash. It doesn't ring. It's not that I'm sat there thinking, oh, oh I can't sleep, and then you hear that little ping, and you're like, oh god, maybe there's something really interesting that somebody's posted. I'd better quickly check, and then you check it, and you find out actually it's just somebody who's posted a picture of their hamster eating a bit of apple or something ridiculous. But, of course, now you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or other social media brands. You've got to have a look at everything else because there might be something else that's really useful in there. So actually taking that time away from screen, um, if you're there with your family, it's massively important to keep connected with them. Uh, yep. If you're walking around the whole time with a mobile phone in front of your face, you know, it's not conducive to – we are able to take some of this family time back that you know we we have lost um also coming away from the screen sort of uh, prevents you sort of going into the i'll just do a bit more work or i'll just do this next thing or i'll just do this next thing and, and just see where, yeah. it, where it ends up so screen time away from screen time make sure that you're taking your exercise time um it, it's really important to get out there in the sunlight uh, while we've got it because it doesn't happen that often yeah, we've been very lucky that, that we are in this situation at this time of year. You know, massively, we count our silver linings, and this is definitely one of them. Massively, massively. So get that sunlight, get that, that vitamin D into you, get that positivity of being able to walk around and, and do this. When I go for my walks, I leave my phone at home um, because I'm going on a walk, and I want to go yeah. out and I want to enjoy and I want to listen to what's going on. You know, there are mindfulness principles in there where we're, we're just listening to, to our environment and appreciating exactly what we have. Um, because wherever we are in the UK, we are in this position where we are more appreciative now of what's on our doorstep than we probably were before lockdown started. Yeah. Because we can walk past it and we've got that quiet and, and whatever takes place. So, I leave my phone at home. I don't take my phone on my, my exercise walks and, and things like that. I know people relax by gaming. By like gaming, uh, yep. Yep. Again, I, I, if used correctly and in moderation, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that concept of escapism and, and sort of getting on there and, and being somebody else in a different scenario, in a different world, can be really, really positive, which, you know, you probably won't hear very many people jumping up and down and saying, get on a computer game. Um, Greg, what's the, what, what is it that's behind that? You sp spoke about escapism there. Is it is it simply the benefit of doing something different, of breaking up your day, of disconnecting from the work that perhaps preceded it or, or, or so on? There are a couple of things that play in. So, the concept of escapism is just not being you. So in actuality, at the moment, you is in a location in the middle of a lockdown during a pandemic or a shed. Uh, <laughs> but when you're on that game, you're an avatar who is running around blowing up whatever or whatever your tasting games might be. Um, you also have something involved called the flow state. Now, the flow state is something really important to humans and human minds. 
and that's that ability just to switch off everything and and just live in that moment for that period so we've all started doing something and then you looked at the watch and then you're doing it and then you kind of look back at the watch and four hours have gone or whatever and you're like hang on where did that go because yeah. we've been so in that moment in, in what we're doing. So the the key to this is the, the the moderation. What I'm not suggesting you do is jump on your games console or your PC and play FIFA or whatever for 19, 20, 24 hours a day. Yeah. But actually, as part of my day, I have a slot of time that I have allotted for me to go and, and and play computer games if I want to go and play a computer game or yeah. you know that's my free time that's my you know if I want to go and read a book or go and read a book you know I'm not regimented in I'm going to use this approach at this time every day because yeah. how I'm feeling will change every day so you know maybe I want to blow something up today I'd better go and, and, and play a computer game or you know I want to go and immerse myself in this book that I'm really enjoying and whatever the case might be so it's kind of what I mean about structure and, and being able to manage your time effectively, um, but effectively for you in the best way that you know how. Yeah. It sounds, you spoke about being present or the concept of being present. And certainly, you know, we're seeing um, the people being more present with their families, with their friends, with um, reading books, um, whatever it might be, you know, going out for for a walk. You see that in the photos that are being shared of flowers at this time of year. Um, what are the are you how how do you feel the UK is responding? How do you think we've coped with this situation of quite significant and sudden change? It, it's a really difficult question because I think obviously we are all different and. Um, you know, just just in terms of our ability to cope with things, our lifestyles, our way of living, where we live, how we live, who we live with, it, it's it's a huge um, plethora of lots and lots of different stuff. Um, there will always be people that are coping okay. There will always be people who are not coping okay, whether that be pre-COVID or, or, or post-COVID. Um, I think the UK uh, on the whole is doing the best that we can with what we've got. And I think that's all we can expect anyone to do. Um, you know, and, yeah. and but in turn, that means if you are not doing okay, that's okay as well. And that's when you're reaching out and you're speaking to people and you're engaging with uh, with help and that support can be put there for you. So, you know, there's, for me, there's no point in looking around a room at, at, at 20 people and saying, well, I'm the, I'm the one that's struggling. We don't actually yeah. know. I don't know what's yeah. going on in, in your life. I'm assuming that your life is okay and everything's great because you're not telling me anything else. But actually, mm -hmm. I, I can't be there 120% saying absolutely everything is okay with you. But what I am doing is making mm -hmm. that judgment that you're better off than I am. So, yeah. you know, rather than comparing ourselves to other people, what I advocate strongly is actually just being honest with ourselves about us. So it doesn't matter yeah. who else is coping well or if your mum's doing well with this or whatever else. In terms of that initial reaction, obviously we want our family and everybody to doing as well as they can. But that initial sort of, well, he's doing all right, so I should be doing all right. It is kind of we, we we've started to leave this behind in mental health full stop. There's a long way to go. And the, this is one of the, the sort of more difficult things for people to actually come forward on when yeah. they're, they're looking around a room or they're looking around a webinar or they're looking around a, a Facebook chat or whatever the case might be. And they're going, well, they seem all right because they're not breaking down in tears and telling everyone about how rubbish everything is. Well, yeah. we don't know. And that's what we're and that's what, you know, certainly your your guys that I've been working with, they're there to find that out. They're there to be the person that you can speak to. And then they're there to sort of work out how best to deal with it and, and where to refer it. So 
you know, as a nation, we're doing the best that we can, and that's all anyone yep. can ever expect of you. Yeah, absolutely. Craig, I'm going to ask you final question about what literature you would recommend, but uh, I'm going to give you a second to think about that um, <laughs> and ask everybody who is watching this to pop down to the comments if they're here or, or here or below um, and just type in a, a comment that of, of a book that you've read that you would recommend to other people or something that you have done that has been kind to yourself whether that be bake a loaf or go for a walk um or, or whatever it might be just pop a comment in there and as craig tells us what literature he would recommend let's start to see those comments coming in and we'll put some of those up on the screen so, so craig what what literature would you recommend for people it's an interesting question a lot of the the stuff that i tend to read is put out by a lot of the, the very large charities so mind has some fantastic resources but they also have some really nice stories about individuals who have come forward and uh, and share their experiences and i think that's being able to sort of understand that we're not on our own and that people are actually out there putting these types of things forward always makes me feel so much better that, yeah. that I'm, I'm reading this story and you know what? Not all of the stories are, are, are sort of the what I would call your X factor moment, where all this stuff happened and then it turned out absolutely wonderful. And now I'm singing for Simon Cowell or whatever the case might be. You don't <laughs> want to be singing. Um, you don't want to be singing. That. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's really really important to me to actually sort of be listening to what's going on and keeping abreast of a lot of the the, the stories that are out there. I, I tend to blog quite a lot so you know, quite clearly i'd recommend my own blog for people to read yep. but i think the good thing about um blogging and talking to people in that manner is that again blogging can be very honest um and when people start writing in in that respect um that's when i really take notice because i i i like i like the raw stuff i like actually sort of listening and, and learning from people who put themselves out there um and and that's why i go that way more than sort of um books and literature books and literature are great for mental health um in terms of just general literature and just going and reading something just because you want to read it and whether that's yeah. something trashy or whether that's you know a, a, a huge great undertaking that you always thought that you could never do just having that space to read is 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 really really great absolutely we've had a, a couple of recommendations come in the alchemist was one um and factfulness which is one that i can absolutely vouch for by hans rosling is yep. a very good one as well um and uh, and thank you ruth for the for the comment in uh, re regarding going for a walk and having a call with a friend um so all these all these things to help take water out of the bucket um craig we're we're pretty much up up for time in fact we've gone over time but it's been such an interesting conversation that i've allowed it to go over time quite happily um so so we'll, we'll start to wrap up i know we've got some resources that we're going to share at the bottom of the screen I, I want to kind of say thank you to everybody who has tuned in for the last 40 or so minutes um today you know we appreciate uh, it's a lovely day outside for most people and and appreciate your your time and attention here and i hope that it's really been of benefit we're we're more aware now than ever of the need to support and and be supported when it comes to mental well-being and, and i love that quote um, or that phrase that you used earlier on i think that one's a really important one that people don't care how much you know until um, they know how much you care we put that up on the screen um you know i think that's, that's a really nice phrase to take away so there's some great resources that you've actually mentioned and we put them up on the screen a little bit earlier but there's um, mind org.uk and the nhs uk mental health support that you mentioned right at the very start of the conversation um, and of course mental health at work at mental health at work.org as well so craig thank you very much for really taking the time today to share you know your experiences your your thoughts your recommendations with everybody i really hope it's been valuable certainly i've taken a lot from it um 
how can people contact you? Well, I know the answer. We're going to put it on the screen below. Um, <laughs> I have an additional question. Is your blog the mental, uh, the business mental wellbeing dot com? It is, yeah. That's so blog. everything is on that. In fact, there's even a video about the bucket and and, and things like that. So uh, yeah, you know, uh, there's quite a few resources. But again, you know, I, I urge anyone who is having an issue or struggling, you know, and just needs to put it out there somewhere. The email's there. Um, you know, I, I will respond to as, as much as I possibly can, um, you know, and, and businesses out there who are just sort of interested in how it is that they might be able to sort of change that that culture or, or sort of improve even, you know, five, 10 percent. I'm, I'm at the end of a phone. Um, you know, I don't leave my house that often these days. <laughs> very good well i'll uh, i'll send a pasty around for lunch and just leave some either fiver um sellotape to the door sounds perfect for me and uh <laughs> craig really appreciate you joining us thank you very much. we've got a couple more recommendations for a book which i'm going to put up now so love love yourself uh love yourself like your life depends on it that's oh, one for everybody um again factness and uh, james recommends We'll go out and grow some veg. And he assures me it's not too late to put some some seeds in the ground. So get get that veg in. Thanks very much, Greg. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Go and have some nice lunch. And we'll see you all again soon. Take care.